Thank you, Garrett. You know, while they're setting up here, I have to say it's always been a, um, a goal of mine to, to ask questions of a futurist. And the reason for that, as strange as it sounds, is plausible futures um, always seem plausible. But how you connect them to the present is really what, what makes people feel like those are really sound plausible. So what I wanted to do is take you into maybe a few areas of, if you don't mind, of kind of those differing views that you mentioned. Um, and so let, let's start with, um, you made a statement and you've written about these um, uniquely human elements. And I think there's a whole camp of folks out there that would say right now that um, all biological systems are algorithmic. How do you respond to that? Well, the argument that says that we are essentially fancy machines, you know, it's, it's not new. It's been around for a long time, yeah. all the way uh, back to the philosophers. You know, I think if we are fancy machines and we're far away from understanding what the fancy machine is. Mm -hmm. So my theory is that if we are fancy machines, we may find out in a hundred years how we actually work. Right? In the meantime, we operate on so many channels that compared to computer are a magnitude larger. So there, there's things that we can't really define, the Polanyi paradox, right? Yeah. We, we do things that we don't know and we can't automate what we don't know, like creativity. I mean, try to define, a computer can write a piece of music, yes, mm -hmm. but is that creativity? I think that we can safely say for the time being, it's kind of beyond us to describe how we do this. You know, what is love and happiness? Mm -hmm. and, uh, you may argue that eventually we can discover the code behind happiness. I think that's probably further away than we have to think about at this point. Mm -hmm. But well, uh, when you, as you think about and, and have projected from the present to the future, I, I would describe you as a, as an optimist. I think that came through in your your brief uh, remarks there. But um, do you ever wonder if you are merely being an optimist in in that view? Do you feel like um, do you feel like there's enough people working on these problems that um, they're putting you in a position where you worry a little bit and you just don't write about it and talk about it? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's funny, you know, sometimes, sometimes I have speaking engagements where people are saying, wow, that was really like dystopian, I'm, I'm worried now, you know? Uh, and I haven't even started with the argument. Yeah. Uh, clearly, you could look at these things and say, you know, that it's quite clear that machines will take us over in 50 years or that we can rebuild humanity or program our babies or, you know, that's Hollywood material, really. I think in many ways, yes, it becomes possible, but these are enormous powers that we're unleashing. You know? The solution is not to go back and de-leash the power. Uh, that, that's just not doable. Mm -hmm. right? the, the solution is to say, what do we do with this enormous power? If we can program human genes, what are the rules? So if you take that one, for instance, the UK is allowing testing right now of three-party art artificial insemination. You find a genetic defect, you bring a third party's DNA, three, three produce two. And when you get to that, then it's a really simple logical step to say, well, let's just do a catalog of what they're likely to look like, and then let's just pick our babies out of a catalog. Um, it, you know, as, as you think about that, what's, you, you mentioned what are the ethical implications. How do you think about this? Is it a collective um, view of it, or do we have to d get into every individual use case and play mother may I? Because these technologies are often born for good, and they end up in a very different place pretty quickly. William Gibson once said, the science fiction writer, that uh, technology is morally neutral until we use it. <laughs> so the, the solution is really quite simple. If this technology does not further human happiness, then it's probably not a good idea. Right? So to have babies when you're three, when, with, a th with a three personal relationship right, probably results in happiness in most cases. But the idea of saying that you're going to have a catalog of skills you want to pick, right. uh, that will probably not result in happiness. Yeah? And then it's hard to, of course, to say who exactly would decide that, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> But the bottom line is, for example, you know, clearly we would all agree that a drone or a robot that can kill without super human supervision 
would not result in human happiness. Mm. You know, and I think we all agree on that, except, of course, for the U.S. and the U.K., which make them. But a different discussion. <laughs> but, you know, the bottom line is, you know, <laughs> there we have those issues of practicality. So uh, it really comes down to that key question, will this actually make us happier or just more dependent on the process? Yeah. So let's, if we could, um, there were a couple of subjects that you talked about that were um, intriguing, and, and one of them is data ownership. If data is oil here, and you, you know, draw a parallel about territorial rights, ownership, involvement of others, ignorance of the, you know, the person delivering the data. You're walking around in the old world emitting photons, and we're translating all of that into we need to talk to you to figure out what it is. Now we don't have to talk to you. If I had no interest in anything other than what you do all day and none in knowing you, that, that, that starts to lean towards creepy. So how do you think about data ownership in, in this world? And how do you feel about the data you're producing today for people who provide you services? Well, in a nutshell, you know, we made a deal you know, in the first iteration of the internet that we said, we get all this stuff for free, including movies and films, and you know, we just give our data in return, and then we get this universe of, of pleasure. Right? Mm -hmm. So Facebook, right? So we give this data, and then we meet others, and we have the great platform. But just five years ago, it kind of turned around you know, to where we have become the content of these systems. Right? And so now I, I like to use the word data mining with an I, and then I think what we have to do is data mining with a Y. Right? So that we are able to say, well, this deal goes this far and not further. And the companies that do this, they're just as responsible as the companies who make the guns. Yeah. You know, who like to say that, you know, guns don't kill people, but people kill people. Right? And what a stupid argument. But the, this idea of saying, okay, the companies that make these tools and be they artificial intelligence or search engines or they are becoming responsible for the possibilities of usage. Right? not like a network carrier right, that carries a network, but a platform, that's a whole different thing. Mm -hmm. So basically it comes down to this. Now we come, we come to the point where these technologies are so powerful that the use to the platform provider has increasingly generated more value than the use to us. And that's fairly new. Right? Mm -hmm. And now when it needs to be leveled out in some way that we get control back and also get the benefit back. And that's what's happening right now. That's the discussion of this. And I think that's when we have a give and take that is proportionate. And in addition, now we're going to start paying for things like we are for Spotify or Netflix right, that we used to take for free in return for data. Mm -hmm. So it's great for content owners because people are willing to pay rather than use their data. Mm -hmm. Well, it, you know, one of the more interesting cases that, or things, technologies that I've seen in the last little while is at a university that decided to hack the data to produce a different result. And they were doing things like altering pictures that were being sent inside text messages. So I know you're you and you send me something and the picture is just very different. How, how do you think about, you, you mentioned one of your exceptions being terrorism, but you know, if you just think about the cyber threat in this world and the ability to make it very hard to find um, embedded, um, challenges where the machine and the algorithm did exactly what they were instructed to do, but someone altered the data and therefore started to, to have nefarious activity in, in the outcomes. Yes, well, of course, that's a complex question, but I mean, uh, terrorism is a consequence of inequality, primarily, not of religion. So when you change inequality by spreading the benefits of technology with jobs and, and for example, if Every city in Europe becomes a smart city, and every city in Africa remains not a smart city. That is inequality. Mm -hmm. So that's what we have to fix. And in general, I think that the, the concept of saying that technology will fix a social or human problem is a bit far-fetched, right? Yeah. I mean, the way that we're going to decide how we're going to get along is not by, having, by asking a bot, right? But we have conversations. Right? I mean, this is what we do, yeah, and this is why we're not data. So we can decide how we do this. And I think this is really important to realize. Technology will take us, give us the tools, yeah. and then we have to talk about who's in charge, what the rules are, and that's really up to us, and that's what we're doing right now. That's why I'm an optimist. You know, we're only at the beginning. 
yeah. of that process. But I think we have a chance to maybe perhaps get this one right if we get started early enough. So let's, let's talk about kind of um, how that leads, time frames of real threat. And, and let's go to jobs. That seems to be where most of the debate is. How many, how big, you know, we, you hear estimates with bold claims of 80%. You hear some say it's not a big deal. And so in that overall scheme of things, I'd like your viewpoint, but also kind of timestamp of where you think threats are and what does this trough of job loss and, and uh, the, the trip to heaven that you showed there with the new industries that are born, what's that look like? Well, I think primarily the biggest problem is today that we're teaching our kids uh, to act like robots. I mean, most schools teach our kids how to fulfill a plan or organize something in the way that it used to work. Right? So we're, we're actually teaching our kids for jobs that don't exist by the time they come out. What our kids really need is to make their own job, to find their creativity, to tell stories, to be kids. Mm -hmm. Yes, they have to understand technology. So that's, if your kid can program and it can story tell, that's fantastic. Right? So we have to start with that because it's totally clear that all of the routine work will be done by machines. Once they are smart enough, that's 10 years away. That is taking out the garbage, cleaning the airport, fixing your fast food meal. You know, mm. that it's, it's a job, but it's kind of routine. Right? So we're going to move up the food chain into the next level of job. Right. And it's very hard to tell a taxi driver that when he's out of a job, then he's going to move up the food chain to uh, you know, to screen a movie or something. You know, that's, that, that's kind of far-fetched, right? So there's a bit of a gap there that we have to address. Then we need social measures and automation tax. I think that's a very big debate because, you know, nobody likes taxes, but we're in the, in the place where we have a rampant shift of the entire logic of work. Right. But in 20 years, technology will enable us to work less, make the same money, and do entirely different things. So this is a, a, a sort of interim period where we need to help. Right? So we're going to move back to foraging again? Is that kind of... <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of forecasts <laughs> saying that in, th in 20 years, technology will enable us to really do the work that we absolutely have to do as humans, which means two, three, four hours a day, make the same money right? and contribute to society in a whole different way. It's called the Star Trek economy. There's a nickname for this, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm quite hopeful that we can achieve that, but it's going to take a lot of wisdom and organization and, and restructuring of the, of the work paradigm. So uh, it, then, if you could, just project that into the, a broader education um, discussion. You, you mentioned what we teach in schools. What about the, the displaced along the way? What's, what's the role of education there? Because there's far more people working today that will feel pinched on hours or you know, we'll get some, some automation, jobs maybe get trimmed, not lost, but how do you think about what we need to do to educate, you know, grown people who have families and, you know, have busy lives? I believe that most people, uh, pretty much all people, have that potential to discover something else. That we have to allow that to be unlocked. So it's a question of empowerment also in the job. If you're a taxi driver, what is your next destination if the job is no longer going to be there? That's a tough question because it's not that hard to drive a taxi, right? But still, I believe that people have those skills, so we have to find the space for this. And, and for example, in Switzerland, we, have, uh, we had a vote last year on the guaranteed minimum income. And it was rejected, but 26% of people in Switzerland said, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be very far-fetched to introduce that here um, <laughs> at, the, at the current discussion. Right? But, I think that the thinking is that we're going to disconnect work and money in some way. And that is basically the result of technology. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, large scale shifts, I think we, we just need to uh, be aware of, of that process happening. I mean, if you're running call centers, that's 42 million jobs, 95% of those jobs in call centers will not exist in 10 years because yeah. software is no longer stupid. Yeah. They can actually do this. Yeah. And so you have 5,000 people left. And so that is a challenge that we have to think about as a society, as, a, as government, as, as a company, to reassign and retrain. You know, education is something that we do every single day for the rest of our lives. It doesn't end when you, when you quit college. Mm -hmm. But in some respects, though, it, it, it 
does practically end for a whole bunch of people who their learnings are inside the company, they're cultural, they're, you know, get learn the language, the people, the processes, and those don't translate well. So, you know, how do you think about that? The main thing, you know, I work with lots of large companies on this. We have to encourage companies to not think of their employees as robots, you know, that execute things, efficiency, right? You know, the, 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 the obsession with efficiency, everything has to be efficient, right? But people aren't efficient. If we make everything efficient, we wouldn't have any people. That, that's the end result, right? right? So efficiency is for robots. Right? It's nice to be efficient, but really what we're seeking is to go beyond efficiency to creating new things, right? new possibilities. Right. And that is what companies have to do, is to not just go with a CFO and say, let's make it efficient and get rid of all these people, they're expensive, right? pain in the butt. And let's readjust those people to create new values. And I think that's the primary discussion with companies we have to have. Yeah, without getting into political differences, what, do you, what would you view the, the role of government in this? I mean, if you were to look and say, you must make these, be involved in these things, what would the short list of those be? Government in general or here? General, not here. <laughs> yeah, we're going to stay out of here and there and all that stuff. Well, the role of government is to do the things you know, that are complicated and difficult to do that require consensus. Uh, and to look at those issues, I think, for example, every single politician needs to know about artificial intelligence, the job loss situation, potentially new jobs, technology, much more than they do. I mean, most of those still have their emails printed, right? So how can you expect a person like that to decide on the future of, uh, of technology? And I mean, three large decisions that are coming up right now. One, what do you allow machines to do in terms of intelligence? Second, when it's about the human genome, what are the rules? And third, geoengineering. I'm going to change when it rains or the sun shines. That's a serious proposal, right? Governments need to collaborate to make this work because for citizens, that is, we have our opinion on this, but this is the government job, right? in my view, yeah. is to address those issues and to have wisdom. And it's quite clear we're going to have, most governments will resort to 25-year-old kids and parentheses, right? who will be like a CIO of the city of New York, yeah, addressing those very issues. Yeah. Women, well, that's the other thing. That's a whole wave of new things coming in for this. So I'm quite optimistic that governments will see this. It will take a little bit of pain for them maybe to mm. get, get it going. Yeah. And, and if I could, maybe uh, for this portion, one last question for you that links really into our business. You showed a lot of, uh, you showed your connected cows um, as an example, and you look at the role of networking in this and, and really even down to the physical networking. How do you think about this sensory network and its explosion and its production of data, its need to evolve? Well, it's quite clear that connectivity is like oxygen now, right? So it's like, this is what we need. On the other hand, of course, connectivity is not something that we as humans always can handle. So over-connectivity, it's, it's like, you know, now there's more people dying from obesity than dying from hunger. I don't know if you know that fact, but it's kind of a sad yeah. fact, right? Yeah. It may be very well the same thing, that we have more issues with over-connectivity than we have with connectivity. <laughs> right? And so we have to keep in mind that this is a tool, right? But once we become the tool and we live in this connectivity with, with my neocortex connected to the internet, I may be losing a few things also. Right? Yeah. So that it's about the balance. That, we, you know, uh, that will be the most important thing to strike for us in the future. When do we use the tool and when do we just stay with us? Yeah. So um, it, it, as you look at the, this thing together, you're, you're optimistic. What would kind of be your, the, the underlying quick version of why an optimist? All of these facts, you, you, you clearly have command of the whole space. W what is it viscerally that makes you the optimist? It comes down to two beliefs. You know, one, I believe that people are in principle good. <laughs> this may be foolish, but, <laughs> but <laughs> the, this is a European way of life, right? Uh, we think that people by and large would do the right thing if you enabled them. Right? Uh, if you don't believe that, then you wouldn't want to go down the road of giving them this kind of authority, right? Um, the second one, I think people have these capabilities that are just not used, and we can put them into place to solve these problems, we can collaborate. And the third one is, we have time. 
we're not at the point where we say, you know, in five years this machine will command the world. So we have a, we have a right. runway of 20 years. Uh, and I think we're already seeing lots of good starts. So tech companies are looking to collaborate on AI. Uh, many companies are going towards this direction. So there's lots of good starts. I think this is what makes me an optimist. Great. Well, thank you, Gerd. I appreciate you being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.